in good hands and get ready for a treat because um, Dennis is going to really bring it in on digital forensics. So I'm going to turn it over to him and let him take over. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Very happy to see you all here ready to go. We are going to do a, not a deep dive, but a, a review of the way we might see some digital forensics topics in your cybersecurity certifications from CompTIA, ISC squared, EC Council, ISACA, and a variety of others. First of all, just want to make sure that you are seeing what I'm seeing, a big blue slide uh, with the title of the presentation, Digital Forensics Review for Cybersecurity Certifications. We're going to spend uh, about an hour or so in the first part of this presentation. We'll take a quick break of about 10 minutes and then finish up on the other side. And if you stick with us to the end, you should be able to claim uh, two hours or at least two credits of uh, continuing education to help keep your certifications alive from CompTIA and some of the other vendors. Let me uh, give you just a quick rundown on um, why me, uh, as the uh, presenter of the webcast, what I do for us here at New Horizons. It's a uh, lower right corner of the cybersecurity track. If we're talking about the CompTIA credentials from the Computing Technology Industry Association, also CISSP and Certified Ethical Hacker and the Computer Hacking Forensic Investigator credential and a variety of others from uh, EC Council, ISC Squared, ISACA. But my primary focus, uh, what keeps me busy more often than not, is what we would call the lower right corner of the cybersecurity pathway. If you're familiar with the credentials from CompTIA, our buds in Chicago, the Computing Technology Industry Association, if you have been involved in IT technologist types of activities over the past couple of decades. You may have had exposure to A plus and network plus and even security plus certifications. I'm sure several attendees here in this group would actually have uh, a few of these certifications along the way. Well done. Well, a few years ago, CompTIA split the certification pathway a couple of different ways. If you go uh, to the upper right of the diagram, you see some fairly advanced exams, Server Plus, Linux Plus, Cloud Plus, lower right corner, it gets even tougher. That's my turf. It's a piece that we call the cybersecurity pathway. The incident response topics involving digital forensic techniques make their first appearance in Security Plus. And if we consider Security Plus really is the entry level credential, that is the basis of all of the credentials that come later in the stack, regardless of vendor. Certified ethical hacker and the forensic credential from EC Council, a certified information system security professional credential, CISSP from ISC squared, the auditing credentials and security management credential from ISACA. They all love to see security plus in your background, even though that's not an official prerequisite these things tend to get a little easier if you do have that experience. Well done. So as you go into the lower right corner of the diagram, we run into two credentials from CompTIA that will wear you out on these topics of incident response, cybersecurity analyst plus and CASP, which is really the top of the certification stack at CompTIA. That's CompTIA advanced security practitioner, puts a management level overlay on some really hardcore technical topics. And if you look at the breakdown on exam topics, in fact, let me do it this way. I'll just do this in a sharing window, drag these over, blow them up nice and big so everybody can see this. This is an actual excerpt from the Cybersecurity Analyst Plus Credential Exam Objectives. Love our CompTIA exams. They are so generous with what they put into the public domain to get you ready for the exams. They say, here's an 18-page document with a listing of all the things that you could be tested on if you pursue this credential. Okay, section 4.3, given an incident, analyze potential indicators of compromise, which means you've got to drill in and get some evidence. Given a scenario, utilize basic digital forensics techniques. There it is. They need you to know how to acquire 
and analyze evidence and draw some conclusions about what happened here. Who did what? Can we hold somebody responsible for this hacking activity? Can we hold somebody responsible for this uh, inappropriate use of our IT services? Can we hold somebody responsible for what is clearly a violation of policy? If we're going to make those types of declarations about who did what, we've got to get the facts straight and we've got to be backed by evidence. So you are expected to know a few things in your search certification exams, it gets a little tougher in CASP where we throw the management level overlay onto this. And you still need to know those hardcore technical topics about how to acquire and analyze evidence in a forensically pure manner. If we're going all the way to presentation in court or maybe presentation to uh, some corporate tribunal, which might make the determination that somebody keeps their job or they're out of here based on what they did, We've got to get it right. So yes, across multiple security-related certification exams these days, you do need to know your stuff when it comes to these forensic techniques and in incident response. So that's what we're here to work on today to give you a nice overview rather than a detailed technical background, no lab work in this presentation. We will show you some software. We'll describe some hardware. We will describe some of the legal background associated with this as well as a specific testable topic. So feel free to take some notes. Feel free to uh, ask some smart questions when we ask you for questions a little later in the session. I do need to give the standard disclaimer on this. Uh, the presenter, that's me, is not an attorney. I have not been to law school. I am required, really, <laughs> by professional ethics to make you understand I'm not an attorney. I'm not a cop. I work with them all the time, but I am not one of them. So since I am not an attorney, I'm not authorized to give you legal advice. If you have questions about the legal implications of any of these things we discuss, please talk that over with your corporate legal advisor or anyone else who may be authorized to practice law in your jurisdiction. And I know we may have international participants in this presentation today. Keep in mind the legal background that you may see uh, referenced in your CompTIA exams, EC Council exams, ISC squared exams, and others are generally a reflection of the fact that those uh, organizations creating your certification exams are headquartered in the United States. CompTIA, for example, is headquartered in a Chicago suburb, been there many times. And because they are headquartered in Chicago, it is easier for American participants to get there and participate in exam development. And if you know anybody who has participated in exam development, you know that person is bound by a non-disclosure agreement and cannot say a whole lot about that process. So yes, uh, no disrespect is intended to international participants when we acknowledge that there is an American spin on your certification exams, ISC squared, EC council, CompTIA, so many of them are headquartered here in the United States. So yeah, you'll see that reflected in the exam content. Let's look at some of the roles in which you might use digital forensic techniques in incident response. You can look at a nice breakdown, uh, which actually comes from some of the official CompTIA courseware where we discuss the team roles for incident response, depending upon your level of responsibility for all this, you might end up as a manager or team leader, a security specialist to play a support role. So do help desk staff, a crisis communicator needs to speak for the organization with a unified voice. The last place we need you during incident response is on the phone. You have too much to do uh, rather than answer questions to employees, members of the media, and so forth. Certainly the legal counsel or legal liaison will handle not just the legal matters internally, but also uh, be that point of contact uh, to the criminal justice system or perhaps the civil law system on the outside. So where do you fit in all of this? As you take CompTIA exams, EC counsel exams, and others, you are there the investigator or first responder role. Your goal is to discover the source and impact of the incident and preserve evidence. If we are sloppy or careless with evidence, 
we may not be able to follow the case to its conclusion. So we have to be ready for forensic response with some assumptions in mind. We know our hardware, we know a variety of operating systems. This is in fact a typical thing that we see in the mock interviews that we occasionally do in class or our live presentations in the live room. We'll just put you on the spot, take volunteers and uh, do a mock interview. You are in front of the panel applying for that job. And we're going to quiz you on what you know about a variety of hardware and software platforms. And when somebody says, I really know my stuff in Windows forensics, or I have trained as a Mac forensic practitioner or a mobile practitioner with the Android platform as the target. Okay. What do you know about iPhones? Well, I just said Android. Yeah, I got it. What do you know about iPhones? If you're the Windows forensic practitioner, what do you know about the Macintosh? What do you know about Linux servers and Unix workstations? You really are expected to know your way around a variety of operating systems. And we can't all be experts on every possible operating system. So we tend to do this in a team environment. If I am the Windows forensic pro and I am staffing the team, I want somebody with more experience in non-Windows operating systems. We all need to know a little about a lot, but we tend to staff our teams with uh, experts in those subjects. We need to know a variety of pieces of software above and beyond the operating systems, know our variety of tools, what we can do with virtualized environments. We have to know systems that must stay active during investigation. If I'm called to do a capture of evidence on a desktop PC and I follow a general rule that says, if it's on, leave it on. If it's off, leave it off. Well, that's easy. If the system is off, I can bag it and tag it and take it away to the place where the hard drive will be analyzed. If it's on, I do have a fair chance to grab the contents of RAM before we pull the plug on the system. But what if the system being analyzed is a server? What if it's not even a computer? What if it's a router? What if it's an ethernet switch? What if it's a GPS device? So there are a lot of rules and we will look at some of them before we're done about what we do in that beginning part of incident response where you have to determine, must this system stay live while we capture evidence or can this thing be safely unplugged and transported. We have to make sure that there are policies in place and we are following those policies. We have to know the laws and regulations one more time. I'm not an attorney. I cannot give you legal advice. Anything that I might tell you about the law applying to these cases is certainly no substitute for legal advice from someone who is licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. And it's not just law. In some of your bigger corporate environments like healthcare and finance, there are matters of regulation where we would expect not your attorney, but your compliance officer to give you the best advice. Please do not expect your attorney to also be your compliance officer. And you do need good advice from both. We have to know four types of evidence, not just in our professional practice, but these are things that we would actually expect to see in some of your certification exams from CompTIA, EC Council, ISC Squared, and others. So let's know them. Real, documentary, testimonial, and demonstrative evidence. These are not the only types of evidence that we might encounter. We'll even mention a few others before we're done. But these are the ones that we would see pointed out in your courseware as the big four. These are things that would tend to establish or even disprove a fact. We could call that exculpatory evidence if it removes the burden of suspicion rather than backs up the burden of suspicion. The evidence that we get in our digital forensic practices could be useful in criminal or civil or corporate investigations. Of course, different legal rules will apply depending upon where this happens. So let's look at those big four types of evidence that you would expect to see on your certification exams. Real evidence is something that you could take into court and present to a jury. It is the most powerful type of evidence. It typically speaks for itself. If a burglary has been committed and the careless burglar knocked over a vase, picked it up, it's broken, and we have fingerprints, we have fingerprints and blood, we've got DNA, 
We've got footprints. We've got a variety of things nearby that might indicate the guilt of this particular person. Wait a minute. We don't say guilt as forensic practitioners. Guilt and innocence are not up to us. Guilt and innocence are really up to a jury or some other trier of fact. In a corporate environment, it might be executives sitting on some corporate tribunal. Well, in any case, we are bringing real evidence, typically in a physical context, before a trier of fact. Let's call it a jury. This evidence typically speaks for itself. If the claim is made, uh, this person was involved in this burglary, and we have this evidence in the broken vase. I've got blood and other DNA. I've got hair. I've got fingerprints. And we actually bring the broken vase into court, present it to the jury with the claim, this is the real thing that was broken in the commission of the crime that would be considered real evidence. Documentary evidence is generally in written form, and uh, you can imagine the impact of this in your corporate investigations as we have so many things generated in modern IT environments which could be considered documentary evidence. Server logs, email spreadsheets, database files, web pages, all part of the modern IT environment, they could all be offered as documentary evidence. However, they could be faked. Somebody with a high degree of technical skill may figure out how to remove an entry in a server log, change something in an email or a spreadsheet or a database file or a web page, cover their tracks, somebody else temporarily gets blamed for doing the thing that the mischief maker actually did. So documentary evidence is important. It's not as powerful as real evidence. Testimonial evidence will be the statement of a witness under oath or affirmation. Testimony could be delivered in court or recorded in a deposition. It typically validates or supports the other type of evidence. So if we have testimony from somebody who overheard the thing that is currently in dispute. If my colleague Terry Mott and I are discussing the sale of a used car, I have agreed that I will buy Terry's car for this amount of money. And I try to go back on the deal. No, I never said I was going to pay you $10,000 for your used Toyota. I said $8,000. Somebody overheard the conversation, maybe even was invited into the conversation. I said $10,000. I owe Terry Mott $10,000 for the used car if we do go through with the sale. That's the conclusion that could be reached from testimonial evidence delivered in court, recorded in a deposition. You might put somebody uh, under oath in that circumstance or affirmation, a little trickier to do that in a corporate environment. Talk that over with human resources and your corporate legal advisor. Demonstrative evidence explains or recreates other evidence. It does not speak for itself, but it illustrates, it clarifies previous points, and you might be called upon to help explain a technical topic to a non-technical audience. So, If the point of the testimony where you've got an employee accused of doing some inappropriate thing based on their physical presence in the facility, and they say, no, it wasn't me, somebody spoofed my identity because they were able to spoof my employee ID badge, and the employee ID badge uses radio frequency energy. I'm sure you've seen these types of ID badges. You hold them up to a card reader and it goes bloop, click, and you uh, can go in through the locked door that otherwise would not have been unlocked. Okay. Mr. Tibb, could you describe the technique by which somebody could spoof an employee ID badge that uses radio frequency energy? Of course, I'll be happy to deliver that testimony in court. And so we can describe the process. And I address my comments to the jury. It's even better if we do this. If the attorney says, Mr. Tibb, could you demonstrate to the jury how someone would actually spoof an employee ID badge that uses radio frequency energy? I'll be happy to. And I've brought my kit in uh, with the blank ID card, and we've got the uh, real employee ID, and we clone that ID, and it just takes a few minutes to get this done, and we show a demonstration where the employee ID has been cloned, maybe even without the knowledge 
of the person whose identity was compromised. Whoops, that is called demonstrative evidence. It explains or recreates some other evidence. It doesn't speak for itself. This will be very helpful uh, to help the jury understand. You see this in the cop shows all the time. It's called the CSI effect. We will follow the best evidence rule whenever possible. Evidence presented in court should be original. In the United States, we have federal rules of evidence that might consider a printout of computer data to be original if it's an accurate representation of the stored data. This was a major flip in the way that evidence is handled and described in courts. Proper bit-for-bit forensic image of the hard drive might be considered best evidence. Who says so? The Supreme Court of the United States several years ago, they passed some legislation setting up federal rules of evidence. They amend this from time to time. If you follow the link down there at the bottom of the screen, you would see the web page over at the law school at Cornell University. Beautiful breakdown on federal rules of evidence. I'm going to drop this link into the chat window directed to everyone. Grab that link. Very important and powerful stuff. You do need to know a little bit about federal rules of evidence on your certification exams, like cybersecurity analysts, the forensic exam from EC Council, CISSP, and others. So in class, we would actually point out which of the federal rules of evidence would be more likely to be testable. And we do the deep dive into those federal rules of evidence. For now, grab the link stash that away in a safe place, look over rule 701, rule 702, look over the expert witness testimony as well. Good stuff there. Look for a mention of search and seizure in your certification exams with special attention paid to how we do this in the United States, going all the way back to the Bill of Rights, the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution give citizens protection against what the writers of the Constitution, James Madison specifically, called unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, Failure to observe proper procedure could actually ruin the investigation. The presumption of innocence is not optional. We are innocent until proven guilty in the American legal system. So if there is suspicion that some criminal hacker uh, is doing their thing and based on registry information, based on IP address records, based on a variety of uh, forensic clues, we can determine that this criminal hacker is probably working out of this piece of the city based on these IP addresses that have been tracked and traced. Okay, the way we see this on the cop shows is that the uh, digital forensic technician says to the detectives, uh, go eight blocks down 33rd Street, turn to the left, the third brownstone on the right, you go up three floors, two doors down from the elevator, there's your hacker. Can't happen that way in real life. What we can do is get a general idea of where somebody is and what they're up to, but the cops certainly cannot go to a big apartment building and just go knocking door to door. We believe there is criminal hacking behavior happening in this big block of apartment building, so we're just going to go door to door asking to be let in, and we'll look around or let ourselves in if nobody answers the door, and we'll figure it out which one of these apartments contains our criminal hacker. They can't do that. They need search warrants if they're acting on behalf of government, describing exactly what they're looking for and exactly where they expect to find it. And we would expect that those search warrants are signed by the appropriate legal authorities, judges, magistrates, and a few others. In a corporate environment, do you actually need that same type of search warrant? No. You might use some of the paperwork that law enforcement uses and modify this, obviously, uh, to fit the unique circumstances of your organization where you could get someone to give you consent to search electronic media. And of course, this is going to be a lot easier if the thing you're searching is a company owned device. Uh, You've bought smartphones and tablets and laptops and desktops for your employees? Do you have a right to see what is happening in those computing devices? Absolutely. What if it's a personally owned device? You may have some legal issues. So again, talk this over with whoever provides legal services to your organization. If it is that corporate or private investigation, so it's not conducted by government, we do not have 
those same Fourth Amendment issues. There's really no protection against unreasonable search and seizure unless this thing has been explicitly called out in a policy signed by the employee. These types of investigations are generally going to involve violations of security policies rather than criminal behavior, work with the guidance of legal advisors and senior management, and I would even say human resources because of the unpleasant effect on the career path when somebody is found to actually break the rule and uh, they know they were supposed to uh, follow the policy, it's very difficult for somebody to say, I didn't know this behavior was not appropriate. Well, Sparky, you did in fact sign the acceptable use policy when you first came to work for this organization. We've got your signature on the document. You got a copy. We got a copy. Let's dance. Look at some things related to the scope of the investigation. Here is the goal. We want to gather admissible computer-based evidence of a crime, a security policy violation, or a similar incident. And you will notice that I have put the word admissible in bold and italic, and it is one of about 12 times that you will see it here today, just in this brief time that we spend together. The evidence might be located in a variety of devices, computers, laptops, desktops, tablets, smartphones, even the network itself, even the infrastructure devices like servers, routers, switches, wireless access points. There is evidence everywhere. And we do not always have the luxury of powering a device down, taking it away to a forensic lab. So we have to be extremely careful in those circumstances where law enforcement gets involved. Do not be shy about asking members of law enforcement to see search warrants. And if the search warrant is too broad and too vague, you may actually lose some pieces of your infrastructure. If there is a suspicion that criminal behavior has occurred in your network, your investigation stops at that point. Law enforcement takes over when they say, yep, we've got to remove Wally's workstation. We believe there's evidence of the crime here. All right, let me see the warrant. Very well out the door with Wally's workstation. Meanwhile, if they say there's also evidence in the server, excuse me, the server that is my Windows domain controller at the heart of my network, you want to unplug and take my domain controller to a forensic lab? Are you kidding? And those pieces of evidence could be gone for weeks or months or maybe even longer. So yeah, it is no disrespect intended to law enforcement when we say, show me the warrant and your corporate legal advisor should be right there with you. They know which questions to ask. We are going to proceed on this fundamental expectation. We want to get an identical copy of the data and work from the copy. In fact, we typically work from multiple copies. We make copies of copies, always keeping a copy in reserve and always keeping the original evidence in a place where it cannot be disturbed, it cannot be changed. And using documentation called chain of custody, we know where all of this stuff is at all time. So that ability to make the bit for bit copy of the hard drive is a common feature of your forensic software packages. We'll see some of them before we're done. And when we say make a bit for bit copy, uh, perhaps invoking a classic Unix utility that's uh, still alive in Linux called DD. It is a data descriptor language. One of the things we can do in that utility is say, give me a bit for bit copy, nothing added, nothing taken away. I need every single possible one or zero that could exist on this drive. And we're not looking at the operating system to tell us how much data is on that drive. In fact, the operating system is irrelevant at that point. When I'm making a bit for bit copy, I mean every single possible addressable bit on the hard drive. And if you know some rules of binary math, you know that a bit can only be a one or a zero. So if I have a two terabyte hard drive in a desktop PC, two terabytes, that's about 16 trillion possible bits, trillion with a T, 16 trillion possible ones or zeros in some combination. And I have to get them in the exact order, nothing added, nothing taken away. And even if this is done on a fairly new, healthy hard drive, pack a lunch, it's going to take a while. It can take an 
it can take hours to get that true bit for bit copy of a drive, even when the drive is healthy. If it's some old ragged out hard drive that has been in service for many, many years and there are dead spots and other drama happening on that hard drive, it can take even longer and it can take multiple attempts to get the bit for bit copy, which is really scary because every attempt has the capability of actually changing the evidence. Here's the good news. Your modern forensic software knows exactly how to acquire those images of evidence bit for bit, and then you get a variety of utilities to help you examine the evidence that you copied. We're never actually doing this on the original source of the evidence. And so the rookie mistake in this case would be, well, I've got a backup utility. We use Ghost. We use Windows Backup. We use Time Machine in the Mac environment where we've snapshotted our virtual machines. Why can't I just go into those backups and look for the evidence that would either prove or disprove the case. Nope, not happening. We need a forensically pure copy of the data because this needs to be admissible in a court of law. And for that to occur, we have to make sure we have not done anything that could actually write information to the drive or any other storage device. And when I say write information, I mean, if you flip a bit if there is a one that flips to a zero or a zero that flips to a one out of the 16 trillion possible bits on a two terabyte hard drive, one out of 16 trillion, you have ruined the case. You can no longer pass that off as a true authentic copy of the true original evidence. So if uh, the evidence is there on somebody's Windows desktop PC and you boot into Windows to run the backup utility or you go flipping through files looking for uh, what you believe is the evidence. Nope, we've ruined it. Even just running the backup utility will alter timestamps and log entries and other data. Just copying the files will not get that very valuable data in Slack space. And I can't even ask the operating system to show me what is in Slack space because their operating system doesn't know about the Slack space. If you think about what happens when you delete a file in Windows, and this would be a fun question to ask to uh, the non-technical user in your corporate environment. Hey, Wally, what happens if you've got this document on your desktop. Let's say it's a spreadsheet. We have a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet on your desktop. What happens if you drag that Microsoft Excel spreadsheet into the recycle bin? Well, uh, I've gotten rid of it, but can you get it back, Wally? Oh yeah, I know how to do that. Open up the recycle bin, click on the thing and do a thing called uh, restore or recover. Boom. Yeah, just because something is in the recycle bin or the trash can uh, in uh, the Mac, it doesn't mean it's gone. Okay, so far so good. What if you empty the recycle bin? I think most non-technical users of information systems would say, okay, if I highlight the thing, hit delete again, and it asks me, are you sure you want to delete this thing? And I say, yes, the spreadsheet is gone. It was put in the recycle bin and I deleted the contents of the recycle bin. I emptied the trash. The thing is gone. You can't get it back. Okay, Wally, fair enough. If that's what the user thinks, that's fine. We know better as technologists, obviously. The thing is not gone. There are traces of these things on the hard drive. In fact, even a simple consumer level undelete utility could get that thing back if you get to it in time. Well, what if you don't? What if other things have been written to the drive Windows and Linux and some other operating systems are really not all that good at cleaning up after themselves. And you will actually find bits and pieces of these documents spread across the drive. The operating system can't tell you what's there because those things are in Slack space. The document is not gone. The spreadsheet is not gone just because the user can't see it anymore. It's the index information that has been compromised. The data is still there, but the operating system doesn't know how to get to it, doesn't know how to work with it. All right, the connection between the data and the operating system has been compromised. You will see these bits of information hanging out in Slack space and your forensic software knows exactly how to reclaim those things if they can be reclaimed. One more time, this takes 
a while. You need to be patient and let your forensic software do its thing. I try to include a Sherlock Holmes reference in every presentation because that's what I do. In this case, we will quote the Sherlock Holmes of France. Locard's exchange principle is frequently mentioned across all of your certification exams working in the same general space, CompTIA, EC Council, ISC Squared. They all quote Dr. Locard. This man built the first modern crime lab in the city where he lived in France, Lyon specifically. He went to the police chief and asked for the two-room space in the attic of the police station that was not being used for other things. He was granted permission, and he actually created what we now do in modern forensics. So Locard was famous for a variety of things, but uh, most often we quote his exchange principle. There it is on the screen. I don't need to recite it, but Locard's point was the physical presence of the person who committed the crime has left clues. Well, so do you as the investigator. We can never visit the same crime scene twice because it's not the same crime scene anymore. Well, okay, let's uh, map this over to your corporate environment. If you respond to an incident and we say, okay, we're going to quarantine this site, this office, this cubicle. We're going to go through a procedure reference. We are going to do our best to contain the evidence, make sure nothing gets tam contaminated so we can make these copies of things, hand these things over to uh, the lab technicians and others involved in the effort. That's great. Here's the problem. It's no longer the original scene of the incident. As soon as you get there, it becomes the original scene of the incident plus your presence at the scene. Your presence as the investigator changes the scene, therefore could change the evidence. It's your fingerprints. It's your footprints. It's your DNA. It's your hair. It's any number of things that could come from you are now included in the scene of the incident. As soon as you put your fingers on a keyboard or a mouse, you may have actually changed the evidence. Whoops. So let's follow the work of good Dr. Locard. He is long gone, but he's one of my heroes in the business and his work survives into the current era. Look it over, please. It's called Locard's Exchange Principle. This is a thing you do need to know in your modern certification exams where there is any angle on forensics, even digital forensics. Now think about what we do in modern IET and in incident response. Locard died in 66. Uh, clearly, this predates even the internet, but the work is still valid, even in a digital forensic context. And I would say, especially in a digital forensic context, if we're careless, we may actually compromise the investigation by accidentally compromising evidence. So, Let's be careful. Let's make sure we follow the role of the first responder assumptions here. The incident response happens before the forensic analysis begins. A variety of technicians may be summoned. They have to understand their obligation to prevent contamination of digital evidence. We have to secure it, preserve it, document it. Incident responders, not necessarily the forensic pro who conducts the complete forensic analysis of the digital evidence. Sometimes our goal is to bag it and tag it and have it safely transported to the place where the further examination will occur. So in the corporate setting, there we are, the incident responder, usually a technologist of some type, an IT technician, system administrator, perhaps bigger organization might even have an information security management function that's separate from IT. Then I would expect the leader of that effort to be a first responder. And this is a bit of pushback that we get from time to time. It's something like a CISSP class or the CISM, Certified Information Security Manager class from uh, ISACA. Uh, CISSP is from ISC squared. And those are all about uh, those true management level responsibilities. And so someone will say, wait a minute, Mr. Tibb, you're telling me that now that I have clawed my way up the corporate ladder, I came up through the ranks of IT, I got system administration responsibilities, network administration, domain administration responsibilities, got good at that. 
got responsibility for information security when management split the roles of security and IT. Now I'm the leader of the effort. I'm responsible as the chief information security officer. So I've got the office, I've got the staff, I've got the budget, I've got my ticket to the big show. And you're telling me I'm supposed to roll up my sleeves and be the first responder to a cybersecurity incident? Yep. This is not an eight to five Monday responsibility. Uh, I'm clocking out at the end of the day on Friday. If an incident occurs, don't bother me because I work eight to five. No, it doesn't happen that way. Typically, the more responsibility you get for information security management, the more likely you are to actually be the first responder. And I know that is counterintuitive, but there's nobody better qualified in your organization than the information security manager who has seen it all and done it all. They take leadership of the first responder team, maybe actually hands-on. So, that incident responder generally is a technologist, perhaps a manager over on the criminal investigation. We're dealing with police, sworn law enforcement officers, crime lab technicians may handle incident response, give them what they need to get the job done, do not get in their way. Unfortunately, here's the problem. We believe we are responding to a corporate security incident and in our investigation of the corporate security incident, we reached the sickening conclusion that a crime has been committed here. Whoops. Your investigation ends at that point. If you are the corporate personnel, you may have screwed it up already if you're not following a good forensic practice. So work with your corporate legal advisor who will be that liaison to law enforcement. In fact, pro tip. Uh, this is uh, the classic uh, advice we give in Security Plus and then all the way through the certification track. Mr. Tibb, how do I get better prepared when I have to deal with this in my corporate environment? Oh, that's easy. Take a cop to lunch before there is a crisis. Figure it out. Who is the person in your local police force, your sheriff's office, if you are uh, in or near a state capital, maybe a state police organization, find out who it is that would have authority in that police force for these cybersecurity types of investigations. Take that person to lunch and have some candid discussions about what you might expect from law enforcement. Once the event has occurred, that's the worst possible time to have to figure out who you need to contact in your local police force. It's going to be a lot easier to get some of this stuff done if you already know them and they already know you. So let's look for some good advice. There's a couple of links and I will uh, click on these and drop them into your chat window. Well, there we are. A couple of documents. From the National Institute of Justice, which is part of the Department of Justice, they have an Institute of Justice programs, and they have published this beautiful manual, and they update it from time to time. It's the Digital Evidence Policies and Procedures Manual. This is seen from the perspective of federal law enforcement, but anybody uh, would get some benefit from learning these techniques. And this is the type of stuff that we do quiz you on uh, in your certification exams. And some of these instructions are even the source of some of the lab work that we do in those certification prep classes. Here in the United States, the best advice is assumed to come from uncle is your tax dollars at work. So sure, we're going to follow good advice from the National Institute of Justice. That's at the Justice Department. We're also going to follow good guidance from the Commerce Department. The document is called the Guide to Integrating Forensic Techniques into Incident Response. So if you are in the live session in Zoom, uh, what I can do is actually drop those links. Uh, when we come back from the break, you will see a set of links. In fact, I may be able to do it right now. Stand by just a second. Yeah, I think we can do it this way. I'm going to grab this link. and I'm going to drop this into the chat window with the chat window toggled to the word everyone. So if you're in the Zoom session, go ahead and grab that link, pull that document down, pull this document down as well. And uh, my uh, colleagues handling the social media stuff, I'm sure, can copy those links uh, into the other feeds, the Facebook feed and the LinkedIn feed. So good stuff there. Free guidance. 
from uncle. <laughs> That's a pretty common theme on your certification exams that, again, are usually written by practitioners here in the United States because you're certifying organizations like CompTIA and EC Council and ISC Squared and ISACA are headquartered in the United States. So there is the American spin. However, uh, I can tell you from my professional practice, some of the best advice that I have ever gotten and some of the best advice that I have ever pointed people to is not from uncle, it's from the police in the United Kingdom, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the organization called the Association of Chief Police Officers has put together a remarkable document called the Good Practice Guide for Computer-Based Electronic Evidence. And as I reviewed a lot of this documentation that's in the public domain uh, to make the determination that we would or would not use those things in our certification prep classes, this occurred to me many years ago that this document was the single best document that I have ever seen for that basic training approach to how we handle digital evidence. Well, of course, this is how we train rookie police officers in the United Kingdom uh, who will screw up investigations if they are not careful with digital evidence. So it's a beautifully written document. Uh, the legal system quoted there is the British legal system based on English common law. So uh, if you have this familiarity with the way this is done in the United States, you may see uh, some definitions and some terms that are not as familiar, but there is the link uh, in your chat window if you're watching this in the Zoom session. And the real payoff from that document and the reason we share this in your certification prep classes anytime we mention forensics is what we will call the four principles from the good practice guide for computer-based electronic evidence. So no action taken by law enforcement agencies or their agents should change data held on a computer or any other storage media, which may be subsequently relied upon in court. Okay. If I am the corporate practitioner and uh, I have no indication that we're going to court, should I really follow that guidance? Absolutely. If you don't work in law enforcement, you should still consider the possibility that what we do may be called upon to be explained in court. If we're not even looking at a criminal issue, which would involve law enforcement, but just a civil law issue, we believe this employee is doing something inappropriate. The evidence is there in their workstation. We analyze the evidence. We report the evidence to management and we say, yeah, I think, I think we got the guy. Wally is the one cooking the books and stealing the widgets and doing these awful inappropriate things. And management says, well, we're tired of this guy. We're not going to call the police. We're just going to handle this as an internal matter. Okay. That's management's decision. But then we uh, get pushback from the employee. The friendly termination becomes the non-friendly or unfriendly termination. You can't fire me. I'll see you in court, chief. <laughs> the employee is out the door threatening legal action. And a few days later, the attorney comes knocking and the disgruntled former employee is now suing your company. Whoops, if we did not use appropriate forensic practices in gathering and analyzing that evidence, uh, we may actually lose that case in a civil court of law. So this is not just about criminal matters. So you would substitute law enforcement agencies in that description for uh, those corporate investigators who may actually be you. Second principle, in circumstances where a person finds it necessary to access original data held on a computer or other storage media, that person, that's you, must be competent to do so and be able to give evidence explaining the relevance and implications of their actions. This is about accountability from the investigator. Third principle, an audit trail or other record of all processes applied to computer-based electronic evidence should be created and preserved, and an independent third party should be able to examine those processes and achieve the same result. Sure, if you and I are equally talented investigators, I check your work, you check my work, we keep each other honest. <clears throat> if we're working from identical copies of evidence and you have your favorite digital forensic software platform, and I've got my favorite, assuming they're both good apps, we should reach similar conclusions. If we follow the conclusions uh, and uh, count on the results from peer-reviewed 
forensic processes, we should reach similar results. The person in charge of the investigation in a law enforcement context, we'll call this the case officer, will have overall responsibility for making sure the law and these principles are adhered to. In a corporate investigation, this is probably the chief information security officer or someone in a similar level of responsibility. So there it is. There's the link in the chat window. Uh, pull that document down, stash it in a safe place. This is homework. If you take our classes that deal with these forensic matters, it's really required reading. So as you are up to date on some principles of how to approach the investigation, look at some first steps. You may photograph and record video of the machine, the desktop, the laptop, the tablet, the smartphone, the surrounding area before you unplug cables and power cords. And by the way, when you photograph that uh, crime scene or photograph the scene of the incident, you're not doing that using your personal smartphone or even a company-owned smartphone. You are going to use a camera that was designed to be a camera and nothing else. It may take still photographs, it may take video, probably both, but it's not a phone. You do not want somebody to make the claim that evidence may have been tampered with or may have been compromised across the network, right? The cameras we use for this should actually really be cameras and not anything else. Photograph whatever data you see in the monitor, We'll draw a diagram detailing locations of peripherals and how they're connected to the PC. A simple sketch is a good way to start. You also have some of these sketching and diagramming utilities built into your forensic software. Use for removable media, CD-ROMs, DVDs, USB drives. We even see good old floppy disks from time to time. Look for and document any connections to network servers, off-site file storage, including connections to your storage spaces in public cloud, like Dropbox, iCloud from Apple, OneDrive from Microsoft, Google Drive. Look for any written notes containing passwords, URLs, computer books, manuals, software packaging, anything else to help you determine how the machine was used, determine the time of the last access to that PC and record any time offset. You notice I have put the phrase time offset in bold print and underlying because it is critical that we understand and we record from the very beginning. What time is it out here in the real world? What time is it inside this computing device? And what's the difference between the two? In other words, what time does this computer think it is? This tablet, this laptop, this smartphone, this desktop computer, the server, it believes the current time is this. All right, let's record that. What time is it out here in the real world? And what's the difference between those two times? We will call that the time offset. And I know that sounds like a nitpicky little detail, but recording the time offset properly can actually make or break the investigation. So I'm going to show you an illustration that comes from one of the lab activities that we do in your certification prep classes. We love those labs that are created by CompTIA and EC Council and others to actually give you some practice with some of this stuff when we do this in class. So we're looking at a timeline analysis. Your forensic software has determined that these files were created this date, this time, last access, this date, this time, last modified, this date, this time. Well done. We see a lot of activity happening in a fairly short period of time on that date from 1312. Okay, that's 12 minutes after one o'clock in the afternoon in that local time zone to 15 minutes after one o'clock. So in a space of three minutes, these things happened. And if the thing that I am investigating is the download of a hacker tool, somebody caused a denial of service attack using a hacker tool that was easily found online, easily downloaded, somebody did a Google search and they were looking for a tool to cause a denial of service, that is awful. And yes, it does happen in corporate environments as well as out there in the real world. So the fact that a, 
hacker tool, L-O-I-C, was downloaded this date, this time. It's not a minor detail. And boom, we found it. Low orbit ion cannon. Within a space of three minutes, somebody found the tool online, downloaded it. And that is uh, the hacker tool generally considered a script kitty type of utility because it allows for uh, point and click denial of service, even a distributed denial of service. Somebody gets access to a big enough platform. So the user of this system is busted. Not necessarily. As we say in fraud investigations, we must place the suspect behind the keyboard. Wally, you were logged in at the time this thing happened. You owe me an explanation. And now Wally's offended because I've accused him of what is probably criminal behavior, or at least a very serious violation of a corporate policy. And if Wally says, wasn't me, Mr. Tibb, I was in the company cafeteria like I always am between 12.30 and 1.30, and he's got proof. We've got video surveillance. We've got eyewitness testimony. We have the point of sale system where his debit card was used to buy lunch in the company cafeteria and the cashier in the cafeteria remembers Wally telling her some stupid joke while he waited for his receipt. Yep. Wally's going to win this one. I have incorrectly blamed this employee based on the simple fact that he was logged in. And if there is an actual public declaration, Wally, you're busted. You're going down. Uh, this could end very, very badly for the organization. So we've got to get this right and we got to make sure nothing got added, nothing got taken away. On the other side of a quick break, we are going to examine the very important idea of chain of custody. We are going to talk about some of the hardware and software that we use for some of this type of investigation. We will try to ultimately connect these very important topics back to the certification exams from CompTIA, ISC Squared, EC Council, and some of the others. So stick with us, friends, and uh, what we'll do is put up a graphic and a timer. Let me kill the webcam over on this end to get just a little more bandwidth. I will drop a timer into this monitor. There we go, a 10 minute break. I will use the ugly timer in Windows 10 as I patiently wait for one of you to invent a good looking timer uh, to use in Zoom. <laughs> you haven't done it yet. So I'm stuck with the ugly timer in Windows 10. And as we invoke this timer here at the bottom of the hour, just make a note of what time it is. Uh, I have 1129 Central Time. So 1139 Central Time is when we need you back. Feel free to use that chat window uh, while we are in this break, if you need to check in with uh, the folks managing the session, the social media folks, the people who will get you on the mailing list to get a variety of uh, goodies, parts and pieces associated with this presentation, uh, check that chat window, especially if it is marked everyone, uh, if you're here with us live in the Zoom session. All right, we're going to step out here for just a bit. Take this opportunity to refresh yourself. We'll see you back here in nine minutes and 20 seconds.
Hello, everyone, and we'll get started shortly. I just wanted to ask you guys to drop in the comments um, what company you're with, if you're connected to a company um, in your city and state. Uh, it will um, help us try to um, figure out where you're at, and um, we'll be able to see all the cool cities and states that are watching um, this video. So I'll let Dennis hop back in whenever he's ready. All righty then, we are back and uh, doing fine on time. I promise we will get you out of here at a reasonable time. <laughs> Let me keep you for a little while longer to make sure that we do get um, enough time to actually grant you two continuing education units, if that is the reason you are here. And uh, I hope there are folks here just because they want to learn more about the topic. That's awesome. We appreciate that. But yeah, if you do have credentials from CompTIA or uh, ISC Squared or EC Council or ISACA and several of the others that actually want you to do a continuing education effort to keep your certifications alive, typically over a three-year certification cycle, you get your CPEs where and when you can and free is good. <laughs> So yeah, we do this constantly. If it's not me, it's one of my talented colleagues. There's a bunch of us who participate uh, in these webcasts in our areas of expertise. So if you need to know uh, a lot about querying your SQL Server database for business intelligence purposes, that's not me. That's a level of brain power way above mine. So uh, you would be with one of my talented colleagues who teaches the SQL Server track. You need to know your Cisco stuff. You need to know a variety of professional disciplines. Well, our buds at New Horizons will break these things down to bite-sized chunks generally in these online webinars where you can claim two hours of continuing education credit if you stick with the presentation all the way through to the end. So uh, if that's why you're here, I appreciate your participation in this. Uh, check in, please, in the chat window. Uh, you may be seeing this through the Facebook platform. There's a variety of ways that you may end up seeing this uh, material, but the uh, folks back on the administrative and marketing side uh, will drop some uh, chatter into those chat windows to make sure you can interact with them in a way that you will get your continuing education credits. You'll get a certificate for being here today. All right, let us continue as we're talking about the scope of the investigation and the timeline analysis that is so important. Let us look at the principle of chain of custody. This is one of those things that is always going to be in the vocabulary uh, and all of your certification exams that have anything to do with incident response. We have to be sure nothing gets added, nothing gets taken away. Obviously, uh, we don't want to be uh, in a situation where somebody could claim that we've tampered with evidence or even allowed evidence to be tampered with through carelessness. Well, it's not just we said we locked this stuff away and nobody could have gotten to it. I can't just take this smartphone or this tablet or this hard drive that contains this evidence, lock it up in my desk drawer and go home for the day and unlock it again the next day and continue the investigation. That investigation is ruined if I have been that careless because I have not observed chain of custody. We have to have a written record from beginning to end, beginning, meaning the very first time we encounter the evidence, typically in the seizure of the device, like the desktop PC or the smartphone, all the way through to the time we're done with the evidence. And along the way, it has been analyzed, it has been stored, perhaps it's been presented in court, uh, presented to a jury, perhaps presented to a corporate tribunal, if this is a corporate security policy that has been violated. But in any case, when we're done with that evidence, it goes back to its owner or it gets back to the victim of the crime or it is otherwise no longer in our possession. Every step of the way, we were supposed to document who had access to the evidence and why did they have access to it. So we use a set of standardized forms for this, the documentation from the Justice Department and from NIST that we just showed you right before the break. We'll give you some guidance on this. Our chain of custody documentation helps us to answer these questions. Where has the evidence been? Who had access to it? What's been done to this evidence? Has it been left unattended? And for how long has the evidence been subject to 
tampering? Is there even a possibility that somebody could have gotten their hands on this evidence and therefore altered the course of the investigation? So this takes very careful logging. Uh, the investigators and other participants, even starting with the first responder, will log things like case numbers, item numbers, evidence tags, date, time, location, personnel, who collected the evidence. We get signatures. We get timestamps. We even get witness signatures, really high profile cases. We don't leave any of this up to chance. We don't even want anybody suggesting there could have been a collusion between the investigator and the custodian of evidence. That's the person who cares for the evidence when it's not in the hands of the investigator. So we might even get third parties involved in this to witness and even photograph the handover of the evidence. It is that important in a high profile case. We will even include hash values where your forensic software and other utilities can throw a bit of math at a piece of evidence, get a mathematical digest, an MD, as they call it, a message digest, like MD5. And uh, some of the other algorithms will generate nice big log numbers representing the value of the evidence itself. And the idea behind hashing evidence is that if the evidence has not changed over the course of the investigation, we should be able to prove that mathematically. So we throw this app, uh, sometimes a simple command line utility, at this file. We have hashed it before, we will hash it again. And if you're familiar with the term checksum, perhaps because you've seen that in some of your certification exams, it's the same thing. A hash value, a checksum, it's all the same. We throw some heavy duty math at a piece of evidence, we should get the same number over and over again. And if the resulting hash actually changes, that means the evidence has changed. So we will see these hash algorithms and similar methods built into our forensic software and we can break these things down into two general categories of tools when we consider the hardware-based approach. Our incident response tools will be the hand tools, the cabling, the identification supplies, everything involved in the bag it and tag it effort. If the goal is to get the evidence in such a manner that could stand up in court if we ever had to present it there from the very beginning, we've got to control access to the evidence. And we have to make sure that everything is properly identified. The goal may be at that point to transport the evidence under controlled conditions to the laboratory. Have that hand off to the forensic practitioner who may take the investigation from there. In some rare cases, the corporate investigator may actually be the forensic practitioner. You could be that one examiner shop doing all of this yourself in-house. So the analysis is done under controlled conditions dealing with the evidence that was retrieved from the scene of the incident. We have some essential hardware that we see for incident response, like bringing a laptop with you for the acquisition of data usually with some variant of Linux in it. And we'll talk about that. I'll show you some samples here before we're done. Uh, right blocking is done in both hardware and software. We'll take a variety of hard drives, USB drives, a little simple network equipment like a network hub or a network switch, a variety of cables, and all of the classic crime scene tools for labeling things that have been taken into evidence. The bag it and tag it approach for more traditional forensics is still alive in digital forensics. Gloves, hand tools, cameras for both uh, recording photographs and video. And remember that camera is not the one built into your smartphone. You need separate devices for this. There are a variety of kits ready to go. This one is from our buds at Paraben. They make a set of toolkits containing the Faraday technology. Their version of this is called the Stronghold Bag. That's their brand name. The Faraday cage is a container that will reject radio frequency energy. If we have to take a tablet or a smartphone into evidence, and we believe somebody may realize they're under investigation. They may reach out across the network and try to do a remote wipe or otherwise interfere with the forensic process. This Faraday cage technology will stop that from happening. And this is not a 20th first century innovation, by the way. Faraday did his work centuries ago, and it is still going strong. Over at the lab, 
the forensic workstation is not just a typical tower PC built out with multiple drives. These things are generally manufactured specifically for the purpose of forensic workstations. You don't just convert a desktop PC to this. This is expensive and well worth it. In fact, it is possible to get that forensic lab environment accredited by the Association of Crime Laboratory Directors. Uh, we call them ASCLAD, and uh, their auditors can actually show up at your forensic facility, invited, of course, and look your stuff over and try to determine if you actually meet a standard for accreditation. Well, if this is a digital forensic process, they will want to examine your forensic workstation. They want to make sure you're not just taking off-the-shelf desktop PCs and trying to convert them for forensic use. So with the right hardware and the right software in place, game on. We expect that our software can create disk images. We're not talking about images in a photographic context. We're talking about a complete set of data mimicking exactly what was on the drive, whether the drive is a traditional hard drive, a solid state drive with no moving parts, a flash drive, thumb drive, even a good old floppy disk, a backup tape, any of these sources of evidence need to be copied bit for bit Nothing added, nothing taken away, and we need to be able to prove mathematically with hash values that we are dealing with true authentic copies of the original evidence. So these are some of the things that we would expect to see as capabilities of our forensic software running in the appropriate hardware platforms. This is one that gets a few uh, Scooby-Doo head tilts from time to time when we talk about this in class permanent file deletion. Wait a minute. Isn't the whole point of the investigation to make the bit for bit copies and examine the copies in what bizarre circumstances would we actually need to permanently delete a file? Well, how many hard drives do you want to buy for this effort? We will eventually swap some drives out in that forensic hardware platform. We tend to use some of these same big, healthy hard drives over and over again from one investigation to another. We simply need to make sure there is no leftover data on those drives. We have to sanitize the drives before we reuse them. And that's true of all the equipment we use out in the field as well. In your investigator's toolkit, we will see a variety of software platforms. They could be either commercial software that you pay for or open source software that you generally do not. We would expect a lot of your software platforms to have a lot of the same capability, regardless of where it comes from, if it is accepted by the community, by peer review. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. So we do have advantages. In the commercial software environment, assuming you have the budget for this stuff, you tend to get proven admissibility in court for the major brands. That doesn't mean that your results will automatically be admissible in court, but it's easier to convince the jury if the legal team on the other side can be brought to acknowledge that you are using a well-known commercial forensic platform and perhaps you have qualified to use that software. You tend to have strict quality control for forensic accuracy. Tech support is a lot easier. You get the graphical point-and-click user interface with a lot of the commercial platforms. Great availability of documentation, training, and your supplemental materials on the commercial side. Pack a lunch. This is expensive. A good forensic tool that is a commercial forensic tool may cost you thousands of dollars per year for the license. You may have to be a member of a restricted group of customers like law enforcement or academia to get the best pricing and the best functionality. On the open source side, uh, lower initial cost. The software is very often free. A lot of the open source forensic packages are based in Linux. And in that open source environment, we can even work from source code so you can make your own software based on the work that has already been done by the originators of the product. You can build a version of the software that gives you only what you need. Don't be offended if that does not really fly in court. Uh, your open source solutions may be seen as less standardized and reliable. Therefore, admissibility is the question. Does that mean... <clears throat> The open source software is really inferior to the commercial software. No, that's not about reality. That's about perception. If I am in court presenting results 
that I achieve from open source forensic software, I would expect the legal counsel on the other side of the issue would say, now, Mr. Tibb, would you tell the jury exactly what you paid for this magic software that implicates my client who is innocent? Well, I didn't pay anything for it, counselor. It's open source. It's based in Linux. Really? Dude, free software implicates my client. Of course, they'll try to cast some doubt on the open source software. Don't take that personally. They're doing their job on the other side of the legal issue. Another thing that uh, may be a sticking point, especially for beginners, is you don't always get the full graphical user interface in some of your open source tools, you're much more likely to see things happening at the command line. So no matter what software we use, we should look for tools that meet these criteria. They're accepted by law enforcement, security pros, the legal community. They should be able to export image files to multiple platform formats, have excellent storage capabilities, and be fully functional even when you use portable computing platforms. So what do you do? Just pull all of these utilities in and test them in a lab environment. That's going to take a while. Somebody else has already done the heavy lifting. Guess who? Uncle is on it. The National Institute of Standards and Technology is part of the Commerce Department in the United States government. It's part of the executive branch. Many, many years ago, they were given the authority by Congress to be involved in standards making and testing related to those standards. So I don't have to do the heavy lifting myself. It has already been done. I am going to trust this guidance from the Commerce Department. And if you're viewing this material outside of the United States, there is probably an equivalent to our Commerce Department in your federal government. Every federal government should have somebody responsible for standards making and standards keeping. Well, here in the United States, that's at the Commerce Department. The thing is called NIST. They have a computer forensics tool testing program. There is the link at the bottom of the slide. Let's pull this link up. Let's grab this. I'm going to drop this into your chat window. You should see this if you're watching through the Zoom platform. Uh, and there it is. This is where you can connect to the computer forensics tool testing program, and you can actually search for those utilities that meet the standards specified by NIST. So a good source for guidance. I'm going to trust the feds in this case. I want to call your attention to a couple of software platforms that we typically see in the labs associated with the certification classes we teach at New Horizons as partners of CompTIA and EC Council and a variety of others that need you to know about this stuff. You will very often see lab activities involving a commercial product called the Forensic Toolkit. And the Forensic Toolkit comes from our friends at Access Data. And uh, there has actually been uh, a shift in the branding recently. There was an acquisition, and uh, let me drop this on you. Here it is, the actual download of the product. Uh, go get this, please. This is important. You're going to get a head start on your homework if you take uh, a variety of classes with us at New Horizons where we actually put you in labs and uh, you do these things in sets of virtual machines where it is very safe to actually operate the product. Uh, you actually go in, you examine some data, you make the disk drive images with tools like FTK Imager and a few of the others. So yeah, you can get a head start on your labs. And certainly this is an excellent thing to know about in your professional practice. And this comes from Access Data. It is part of a bigger company called Xtero because there has been a merger recently. Uh, FTK is one of those well-known platforms that's just been around as a commercial product for a very, very long time. Well-known, well-respected. NIST and others will tell you that this is good stuff. So the way you may see this in the lab uses the free component of the forensic toolkit called the FTK Imager. And there in the chat window is the link uh, to go get the freebie. And that's a pretty common thing, <clears throat> excuse me, among commercial software vendors for these expensive forensic utilities, they'll generally give you a freebie to get started. You don't get the full features of the software. You do get enough of the product to get comfortable and familiar and think, you know, I might want to actually license the commercial product. So yeah, if you're uh, with us in these labs, 
uh, for cybersecurity analyst and the computer hacking forensic investigator credential and others, you actually get to use the products in a controlled lab environment. So in this case, the FTK imager is used to uh, deal with some captures of evidence. There is an image file that has been captured. We'll pull that in. We use the DD utility to get that uh, raw image of the disk drive partition, pull this into the app, and now we will do some analysis based on what the tool tells us. You see hexadecimal values converted to text values. There is the evidence we're looking for in that particular lab exercise. This is a uh, an intellectual piracy issue that we actually try to solve uh, in that lab. And you see all of the metadata associated with that thing that was downloaded, where and when, uh, the absence or presence of encryption, uh, the absence or presence of uh, somebody's attempt to conceal the data by hiding it somewhere where the investigator would not think to find it. You don't have to do the heavy lifting, friends. The software is smart enough to figure this out. So this is one that we loved uh, demonstrating in the lab, and you have some fun with it when you do this in the lab activity. So go get the thing. There is the link. We put that into the chat window. The Forensic Toolkit from Access Data, the Encase family of products from Guidance Software, the Paraben products. You see a variety of them in your labs. We get you started with those free versions and encourage you to continue gathering knowledge by getting your own version of the product. Even the free versions would be of some value. Over on the open source side, love this. When I get the question in any class, not just the security related classes, but even in things like Linux plus and network plus and some of the other pluses from CompTIA, because I do teach the entire stack, uh, somebody will always say, usually one of the enthusiastic rookies, when we're talking about Linux, uh, they'll say, Mr. Tib, what is your favorite Linux distribution? What flavor of Linux do you love the most? And they expect me to say Red Hat or Fedora or even Kali Linux, which we use for penetration tests and vulnerability assessments. Nope, it's this one. It's one dude in Italy, and he will update the software when he feels like it. So don't bother him about updates, but go check in from time to time over at kane-live.net. And what you can download is this remarkable Linux platform called Kane. It is the Computer Aided Investigative environment. This is based in the Ubuntu distribution of Linux. This is loaded with forensic tools. I have never had to add anything to this forensic distro of Linux. Many, many times that I've used this out in the field, I've found that I am pleasantly surprised with this distro called Kane. Uh, there is a Windows side as well as a live uh, boot side just loaded with all the classic open source forensic tools. It's one guy in Italy maintaining the distro. So he'll update it when he feels like it. But the updates have been pretty regular uh, in recent years. And the documentation is just awesome. You tend to get community-based documentation on your open source products. Well, this one is really good. I love it and I highly recommend it. So this is a great way to get started in some of your forensic investigations for free in a safe environment. It is called Kane, the computer-aided investigative environment. Another one that we're seeing in the labs these days is this one called CSI Linux, CSI as in crime scene investigation. And this is another one of those that is loaded with free open source forensic tools. And because it is Linux, it is free, it is awesome, go get it. So there are the links uh, at the bottom of the slides, I have dropped those in uh, to the chat window, and you should see those if you are watching uh, this presentation in the Zoom platform. Let's consult some experts, please. Before we are led astray, we want to make sure that we are using not just good software and hardware, but actually peer-reviewed procedure references. In this case, it's not NIST, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of cross-pollination between NIST and this group. It is called the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. They have a set of procedure references that goes back to 2006. It's updated fairly recently. Uh, you'll see many, many updates per year dropped in 
to that list of published documents. And the reason we have so many of these peer-reviewed procedure references available from the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence is the fact that the procedures are different from one platform to another. A device seizure involving a smartphone that is on, and it happens to be an Android smartphone, is dramatically different from the way that we take a desktop PC into evidence when that machine is either on or off. And there are even different procedures for that. If it's on, leave it on. If it's on, leave it off. You've got the fair chance to capture the contents of memory before you pull the plug on the system. If it's a desktop PC, if it's a laptop, a tablet, smartphone, Microsoft, Apple, some flavor of Linux or Unix, the Android platform on your mobiles, GPS devices, servers, routers, switches, firewalls. There are different procedure references for just about every possible device from which we would expect to get digital evidence these days. You do not have to invent the procedures for that. That's already been done. There is the link, swgde.org. If we click there, we will get taken over to the list of published references from the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. And this is not just some forensic pro says, hey, I've got a good idea on how to examine this type of device. These are peer reviewed. These procedure references, before they are ratified, they are put in front of the membership of the scientific working group on digital evidence. And we get to vote on uh, prospective changes to those references. Hey, this has worked well for me out in the field. This other thing is a little problematic. Finally, with all of that peer review, the procedure reference is ratified. It's validated. It goes into that list of published documents. So yeah, before you have to invent any forensic process, and it's extremely unlikely that you'd ever have to do that, you go to these sources of expert guidance. NIST and a variety of others can help you out. But the way this currently sits in the United States and maybe even around the world, there is no better source of guidance on actual forensic procedures available to the general public than what we see right here. This reference from the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. So please follow that link, bookmark that. That is homework. That's a thing that we actually work with in class. Let's look at a few things related to the handling of digital evidence. We've talked about chain of custody. You keep this documentation, uh, those lists of who had access to the evidence and when and why. We get signatures and timestamps and witnesses sign off on all of this. Every link of the chain of custody has to ensure your evidence remains unaltered. So we use standardized and repeatable processes and documentation, whether we do this in the lab or out in the field, we have to make sure the evidence is as undisturbed as possible. And we always conduct our investigation with data integrity in mind. Imagine yourself in court, maybe even in a corporate tribunal and legal counsel is staring you down from the other side of the boardroom table. But it's probably a lot easier just to imagine uh, answering these questions in court. How was the original source being protected? How was the evidence acquired? How was it copied? Did you change the original data in any way? And how can you be certain that any of these things is actually correct? If you answer, I don't know, to any of those questions, your evidence might be ruled inadmissible or invalid. Whoops. So we have to pay very careful attention to what we do when we encounter volatile data. Uh, things that are in memory, not written to the hard drive, but actually in RAM, uh, memory caches, CPU registers. Those things are extremely fragile. Those things will be gone uh, when the power is not there. The device is either accidentally or deliberately separated from electricity. Poof, certain pieces of evidence will no longer be available. So when we find the desktop PC on, we leave it on until we can get those bits of volatile data. You may be instructed at that point to try to image the hard drive and more persistent sources of data. You might also be instructed to simply pull the plug on the system and transport it to the forensic facility. You would never 
go through a menu item in the typical desktop incident response, because as soon as you grab the mouse, click on the item in the start menu to power the system down, you have interfered with the evidence. Whoops, you can no longer pass that off as the true and original evidence. Remember low cards exchange principle that we showed you earlier. So we have this perishable data. You've got to get that immediately. There is more persistent data available, the opposite of the volatile data, things that would tend to remain in storage after the power is off. Might seem a little easier to securely collect this compared to volatile data, but if you make a mistake in the collection process, you may end up with useless and inadmissible evidence. The rookie mistake is actually mounting the drive to look for evidence. We never do that in the field or even in the lab. So you have to enforce write blocking. We create a bit for bit image of the disk drive and you have to do this for as many hard drives, flash drives and other sources of evidence as pertain to that investigation. It can be a tedious and time consuming process. You've got to babysit it from beginning to end. You do not set your software up. I'm gonna capture all 16 trillion possible bits in my two terabyte hard drive. I'll just let this run overnight and I'll check on this again in the morning. Now, uh, you might introduce suspicion of tampering with evidence if you do that. So no matter how you capture the persistent data, you have to hash it. You have to throw a mathematical process at this to get a message digest. It's a massive number that represents that data and you hash again and again at various times in the investigation, and we want those hashes to match. And if the hashes do not match, that's an indication some awful thing has happened to the data. There are three generally accepted methods for duplicating the drives. We can have a dedicated duplication system, typically in the forensic lab environment. We can do this in a system-to-system -system image or image on the original system, which is kind of risky, as we'll see here in just a bit. If you do this in a dedicated forensic system, uh, we showed you one earlier. We don't just try to convert desktop PCs to forensic systems. They are custom built for that purpose. They're going to specialize in bit level imaging. Hardware and software is used to transfer an exact copy of the original data source to one or more blanks. You'll usually make more than one copy. And one of those identical copies is kept in reserve just in case if you use good forensic practices, we should get the same results on identical copies of the drive. It's not always practical to bring that system back to a forensic lab. So you might do a system to system image, depending on the types of drives and the types of connections available, we boot from imaging software on bootable media like CD-ROM, DVD, USB drive, transfer that data using a variety of uh, cabled connectors, serial, parallel, Ethernet, USB. Could you do this by Wi-Fi or even by Bluetooth? Yes, you should not ever use a wireless method to do it. It's possible. Uh, this generally is going to be questioned if you try to present it in court. So yeah, don't use Wi-Fi. Don't use Bluetooth for this. This is slow. It's not well suited to doing this at the scene of the incident. Disk imaging on the original system, this is the worst case scenario. There's just no other way to get this done. You use a forensic boot disk to create the bit for bit image onto a matching hard drive. This is generally used in on the scene incident response when you just cannot get the system to a safe and secure area. You typically have a one-time opportunity to collect that system. So imagine how this might be used in a corporate environment, you have an employee who is suspected, and I don't want to say crime, let's say you have an employee who is suspected of a very serious security policy violation. You don't want to tip him off that he is the subject of the investigation, but it is essential that you get a bit for bit copy of what's on the hard drive of his desktop PC, okay? We'll wait until that person is gone. Somebody saw Wally get into his car and leave from the employee parking lot or somebody <laughs> followed him. They saw him get on the subway, get on the train, get on the bus, he's out of here. We do not expect him until the beginning of the workday the next day. All right, now is your chance. It's going to take a while. This may even be an all night process, but you generally have that one time opportunity to get the state of that system captured. So uh, I hope you have a 
quiet and safe and secure place in which to do this if you have to do this in your corporate environment. Difficult to get away with this in a cubicle because you can't really hide what's going on in that cubicle. I hope this is actually in an office where you can close the door behind you, turn off the light and get to work. As we capture and preserve evidence, you want to avoid possibility of the contamination of data. So your workstation that we use for this back at the lab is on a network that is only in the lab. It does not connect to the rest of the IT environment, does not connect to the cloud, doesn't connect to email servers. You don't surf the web, watch cat videos on YouTube. You don't check your email. You don't do your Facebook or your LinkedIn or your Tinder or your Twitter or your Snapchat or any of that. It is only for forensic work. The only possible network connection could be to other forensic platforms in that small and highly secured lab environment. Under ideal conditions, you're doing this on a workstation that doesn't connect to anything. It is only self-contained. So under no circumstances would you ever want to see a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing app anywhere on the same network as your forensic workstation. So as we capture and preserve evidence let's consider these five things to be best practices and therefore testable yeah, you see these on your certification exams. Be prepared to preserve all gathered evidence in a proper manner for an extended period of time. Replicate evidence across multiple storage media for redundancy. That's awful that you would have <laughs> your evidence that you've seized off of a desktop or laptop. It's on a hard drive and that hard drive crashes. Whoops, yeah, I've seen it happen. So you do want to replicate these things across multiple drives. Be careful when you select where to physically store the hardware create metadata. That's the data about the data, the type, the data it was collected and hashed, what purpose it serves. Evidence rooms need proper physical controls, locks and guards and cameras. A word that we have seen over and over again from the beginning of this presentation is the word admissibility. This is so important. I will call it the key concept, the way we see these forensic topics across all of your certification exams and in your professional practice, we record all actions, decisions, and results promptly and properly with the assumption you may be called upon in court to explain and justify your findings. And once again, the uh, pushback we get from time to time with participants in class is, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Follow the law, get advice from your attorney, but I'm a corporate practitioner. I'm not involved in law enforcement. I'm not out in the field dealing with criminal matters. I'm simply the person who enforces security policy here at Spifco International Headquarters. Okay, what if your company gets sued by a customer? What if your company gets sued by a disgruntled former employee? What if uh, there is some civil legal action? What if there is a HIPAA violation or a graham leach Bliley Act violation or a Sarbanes-Oxley violation? And now you're headed to administrative law court if you choose to fight the enforcement effort. Whoops. Yeah, you did not expect that you would have to uh, be called into court to explain and justify your findings. Well, that's the rookie mistake. Let's assume always that we may be called upon to explain and justify findings in court, even if this is not a criminal issue at the beginning. So you would expect uh, that you get this uh, cross-examination. You get somebody on the other side of the issue trying to introduce doubt into the mind of a jury in a corporate environment, somebody who is defending the employee at their corporate tribunal. <laughs> we believe Wally's out of here because he screwed this up very badly. And uh, the representative of Wally is taking his side. Okay, he's got a right to defend himself. They'll try to introduce doubt on our examination of the evidence. So think about what would render the evidence inadmissible in court or elsewhere. Was there illegal or even inappropriate seizure because we did not have the appropriate search warrant or corporate authority? Did we boot into the operating system and simply look around for evidence rather than making the bit for bit copies like we're supposed to? Did we violate chain of custody, which would cause doubts about who had access to the evidence at all times? I have seen Forensic pros do everything correct. In fact, this is heartbreaking when I tell you that forensic pros that I have trained 
have done everything correct in the investigation and still lose the case because they screw it up in court because they are intimidated by the courtroom process. They did not know what to expect under examination and cross-examination in court. In other words, they didn't have a way to translate their laboratory experience to courtroom experience. Whoops. And uh, watching CSI and Law and & Order and others uh, do not get the job done. That's what we call CSI effect. There's got to be a better way to learn about this. So when we discuss these things in class, this is a thing that is required reading. I drop the document on you and I say reading this document is up to you, but I promise this gets easier if you ever are called upon to present your findings in court or even a corporate type of tribunal, but especially in the court system here in the United States. So this document has got several years on it, but that's fine. This is not a thing that needs to be updated because this is not about any specific forensic process. This is about courtroom procedure. So the document is called Digital Evidence in the Courtroom, a Guide for Law Enforcement and Prosecutors. And you notice that it does not say law enforcement, prosecutors, and defense attorneys, but there would certainly be some value in somebody on the defense side reading this documentation as well. So I'm going to grab this link. I'm going to drop this into the chat window. If you are viewing this in the Zoom platform, uh, you now have the live link for that. And there it is uh, at the bottom of the slide as well. So yeah, this uh, is a very helpful hand from the Justice Department breaking down exactly how we would expect the forensic practitioner to be examined, cross-examined, and ultimately their responsibility to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when they appear in court, whether they work for prosecution or defense. This is what they would expect to have to deal with in court. Friends, this is homework uh, because this type of courtroom procedure is very often called for in your certification exams from CompTIA and EC Council, and ISC Squared, uh, and ISACA. So if you are headed in that direction, where uh, we believe you're going to appear in the test center one of these days, having made the appointment uh, to pursue one of the certifications, get back in touch, please. Uh, Come find your account executive at New Horizons. If you have one, they know how to get in touch with me on short notice. Even if you do not appear in class, we may be able to give you some guidance on doing well on your certification exams that deal with this stuff. That cybersecurity track that we mentioned at the beginning of our presentation today is a hot ticket, friends. And of course, all of us uh, who teach in this environment tend to be cheerleaders for uh, whatever piece of the certification track we have. Well, in my case, it is that uh, lower right corner, as we saw earlier, of the CompTIA cybersecurity track, uh, the cybersecurity analyst, CompTIA advanced uh, security practitioner, and a few of the others, even going all the way back to Security Plus. Your certificate of attendance here today uh, is helpful because we are authorized providers of continuing education for your EC Council credentials, your CompTIA credentials. All of your certifying organizations have different rules for how they deal with uh, your continuing education credits. Well, here's good advice if you are in the CompTIA certification track about how much continuing education you can claim under each certification for each type of activity. You are here today attending a live webinar. So if you're trying to get your Security Plus uh, continuing education credits in place, you can claim up to 10. And well, you got two here and you do two more and two more and two more uh, from different webinars put on by us at New Horizons and a variety of other reliable sources. Yeah, you get your CEUs knocked out with webinars. 15 for cybersecurity analysts, 20 for a CompTIA advanced security practitioner. I have to go take the exams and my colleagues at New Horizons have to go take the exams anytime the exams are new because we're supposed to know what is on the test to be able to effectively teach you how to pass the exam. We don't brain dump, obviously. Nobody at New Horizons or any other legitimate training organization is ever going to help you cheat on an exam. We don't do that. But the more we know about the exam, the better position we are in to help you in your certification quest. So 
we have to take the new exams when the exams get updated. You do not. You simply need to maintain your continuing education effort with EC Council, CompTIA, ISACA, ISC Squared, and the others. So, you know who knows a lot about this? It, it's not just us. It's not uh, just the subject matter experts who are the instructors of the material. Your account executive at New Horizons is also a subject matter expert. Sometimes they're called education consultants. If you have ever had any personal interaction with New Horizons, uh, coming to take a class or take an exam, or if your organization has that existing relationship with New Horizons, you might or might not know that person, but I promise there is somebody at your local New Horizons facility who is set up to get you what you need. Those people are called account executives. Sometimes they're called education consultants. They may have different names in different places, but there's always somebody there at New Horizons who has been there and done that and can get you what you need in testing and qualifying for the certification, getting you into the appropriate training. There's even job placement assistance. We love those emails. Hey, Mr. Tibb, I got the job. <laughs> Sincerely, Sergeant Susie, comma, CISSP, Certified Ethical Hacker. I love to see that in your social media profiles. I love to see that in your signatures, in your emails. When you get back with us with questions and comments, or even just letting us know how you did on your certification exams, we absolutely treasure and value that feedback from you. So don't be a stranger. If you've got questions about any of this stuff, you're welcome to drop a question or a comment into the chat window if you're here in the Zoom session. But keep this dialogue going, please. Present questions and comments and inquiries to your contact at your local New Horizons facility and get in touch. Let us know how you're doing with this stuff and give your uh, smart folks over at New Horizons the opportunity to continue to assist you in your certification quest. Even if you don't know that person by name and you're just now getting introduced to your account executive at New Horizons, I promise that person is working for you quietly behind the scenes. Um, and they're going to do a good job for you. Get in touch. Don't be a stranger. Let them know how you're doing with all of this stuff. They can put you in touch with me. They can put you in touch with uh, your career placement folks, the people handle career development matters at your local New Horizons facility, they are always on your side and they're always looking for a way to better serve you. So get in touch. Let us know how you're doing with this. All right, Terry Mott, how are you? You have been uh, quietly there behind the scenes, keeping an eye on all of this stuff. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, address this group. This has been a good group. Um, you may or may not see all of the things that we have put into the chat window based on how you got into this session. There's a Facebook session. There's a LinkedIn session. There's a, the Zoom session here, uh, which I've had right in front of me for this entire time. So you may or may not have seen all of those links and all of those resources that we shared in the chat window. But I assume that those things are going to be copied over onto the social media platforms. We've got a Facebook group for this stuff. We've got a LinkedIn group for this stuff. In fact, we welcome uh, those connections uh, from you. If you want to, if you want to find us, find Terry, find me, find uh, your account executive at New Horizons, go looking for us in uh, Twitter and LinkedIn and your other social media platforms, make that connection and we will continue to assist you and guide you in this effort. I hope to see you in class, but even if you cannot come to class, uh, if you wish to simply pursue these forensic disciplines and incident response disciplines on your own, you can get some help from us uh, at New Horizons. There's always a, um, a variety of freebies that we can pass your way. 